Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, sir. Is the mic on for the back? Can you hear me? Okay, good. Uh, first of all, thank you all for coming. Uh, I appreciate everybody here, uh, family members, service members, taking the time to join us this evening. Uh, I know uh, an, an hour and a half on a, on a school night, uh, kind of hard, but it, it, it shows your commitment to the community um, and shows your, your, your passion for making sure that, that you've got a safe, secure, healthy place to live. Uh, and, and I completely understand that. To the folks out on Facebook and chat, I am looking at the camera. Um, thank you all for, for watching as well. Our commitment to you is to make sure that as you submit questions tonight, we'll get the questions to the panel so we can also uh, make sure that your concerns are being addressed and, and are being heard here. So uh, as Chad said, so uh, Major General Omar Jones, uh, Commanding General for the Military District of Washington, took command in early June, so been in command about a little over four months now, um, but have been tracking the housing situation uh, here at Mead and the housing situation across the Department of the Army uh, absolutely since February and well before that as our senior leaders have worked through uh, making sure we have uh, the right housing. Again, safe, secure, healthy housing for all of our service members. I'm going to talk a little bit about Army priorities for a minute because it's an Army installation, but I, I know that what I'm going to say is applicable to all of the services that have folks living here in Fort Meade and I think is reflective of the uh, other services senior leaders as well. So we've had a change in the Army senior leadership uh, you know, over the past couple months. New Secretary of the Army, new Chief of Staff of the Army, new Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, new Under Secretary, and new Sergeant Major of the Army. So really our, our, our top five. The good news is I absolutely promise you. Not only does me, Jeff that they are as committed to making sure you have the housing that you deserve uh, here, here on the installation. Um, that is no change. That is no change of Secretary McCarthy being our new Secretary of the Army. It is no change of General McConville being our new Chief of Staff of the Army. Absolutely committed to that, to make sure that the progress that was made continues and it just keeps getting better and that as problems come forward that we've got the right leadership engaged across the army across the installation to make sure that those problems are being resolved and they're being resolved quickly and appropriately to the right standard and so none of that changes the army leadership um, changed over the summer what i will tell you that as general mcconville talks about the army priorities big picture have not changed readiness modernization reform but what it matters to you is he says all of that is about people and he has got a number of quality of life initiatives that he is making sure the army is focused on to take care of our people and one of those five is housing so you've got a new army uniform leadership as focused on housing and making sure that we've got the right housing for you on the installations uh, the way it should be um, my perception and I very much want to hear what you all think tonight is that we have made progress here in Fort Meade but we're not there yet uh, until every single problem is resolved in a timely transparent manner to the right quality where our residents feel like okay um, I feel like I raised an issue and it was addressed very quickly it was addressed to the right standard and I had good interaction with the folks who are solving that problem and we're not there yet so I think we're heading in the right direction, but we're not where we need to be, and we're not going to stop, and we're not going to change the priority, and we're not going to change the focus until all of our residents feel that way. And they feel that they've been approached with that right of customer service attitude, with the right quality, and the right um, transparency, frankly. And that's been my guidance to the team here, as well as the other installations that I'm responsible for. We've got to be transparent in terms of how we communicate with our residents to make sure that they know they are heard and we listen to them and listen to their concerns, that we're transparent to them about how we're addressing those concerns. We do it in a timely manner, an absolutely timely manner for life, health, and safety issues, and that we do it right. And we do it right the first time so that work has been fixed. The last thing I'll leave you with is that there are lots of Department of Defense resources, there are lots of Department of the Army resources that are committed to you all as residents. So I'll just highlight this group that is sitting to my right, your left, behind us, that we brought here from the MDW headquarters, but those folks are also represented here by Colonel, Bragg, uh, Colonel Sprague's staff in terms of the surgeon. So we've got our surgeon sitting back there to make sure you've got the right experts in uniform or from the uh, Defense Health Agency to, ask your, to answer your questions about medical concerns. We have our Inspector General back there. If you have any concerns, you want to talk to an Inspector General. We have Inspector General here on Fort Meade as well. 
And then we've got our lawyer back there. Again, if you've got concerns, if there are claims concerns or other concerns like that, or you're looking for legal assistance, there are plenty of resources available here on the installation, as well as through the District of Washington Command. But my message to you is, is we're all in. We are all in to make sure that you've got housing on the installation that is safe, secure, and healthy, and that you've gotten the right customer service that, frankly, you deserve as a service member or the family of a service member. But thank you for coming tonight. I'm looking forward to your questions. Eric, over you. All right, a slide, please. Can you hear me in the back? All right, because I'm not going to use a microphone. All right, so the slide you see in front of you is what I presented to Senator Cardin when he was here about probably about a month ago. And he came here to say, hey, look, where, where are we with this whole housing crisis? All right. So I put this chart together kind of to show over time where, where we were and the actions we've taken to date. All right. So I'm, it's kind of busy. I'm not going to hit all the points, but I, I do want to walk you through it. Um, 14 February. What day is that? All right. For me, that's doomsday. All right. <laughs> that was a day that uh, Secretary of the Army Esper, Chief of Staff of the Army Milley, Sergeant Major of the Army Daly, and every other general officer that you could think of came and visited me specifically at Fort Meade over the housing situation. All right. And for good reason. I, I'm, I will not cover it up. All right. The housing was bad. Um, so they came here. They saw firsthand what some of the complaints were. Um, from that and on that day, we had Corvius here as well. It was an opportunity then for Secretary Esper and Sergeant Major, our Chief of Staff of the Army, Milley, to sit down with John Pissern, the founder and CEO of Corvius. During that meeting, which I was not a part of, but you know, sitting on the outside, uh, kind of listening in, that's when John Pissern made a couple of commitments. First, he was going to do an air quality test of every single home on the installation because most of the complaints dealt with mold. So he committed to 100%. That's 2,268 homes on Fort Meade, number one. Number two was replace the roofs, replace roofs on the historic housing. And this kind of goes back to a conversation that I had with J.C. Calder, the director of operations, over a year ago. This was in October, before the housing crisis was a housing crisis. And at that time, it was a pretty candid conversation with Corby saying, hey, look, you know, what are we doing in terms of preventive maintenance? Because, for instance, if we're talking about mold and we never clean gutters, right, and you never replace the roofs, doesn't that kind of contribute to probably mold growth? So we talked about a preventive maintenance plan. And that's something that was brought up to General Milley, to John Percern, and then John Percern then made the uh, commitment. All 111 historic homes on this post, so 1932 to 1935 builds, were getting new homes, or getting new roofs, excuse me. Um, from a town hall that we had in January, now again, this is about a month prior to uh, the Army senior leader showing up to Fort Meade, we actually had our first town hall, and I look around here, and I see some of the faces in there, all right? Um, the purpose of that town hall for me at the time, and I was kind of, I was kind of a rogue player at this point, was what are the themes? What, what's going on here that I can kind of trace this back to? So we, we developed some themes, and then from there I was like, okay, well, if these are kind of the main issues, how are we going to fix them? Are we going to allow Corvius on their own to fix them, or should we have some say in the process? From, and based on that mindset, we developed focus groups. And I look around here and I see a lot of members on these focus groups who were instrumental in helping Garrison, helping Corvius see themselves, and then coming up with some pretty doggone good solutions to get after the uh, crisis. So that went on in January, February, March, April, May, June. Okay, So that kind of takes us up to the third quarter here. Most of you participated in the Army, or the annual Army survey. It went out to everybody. Um, well, it, it went out, okay? I wouldn't say it hit everybody, but it, it did go out. We got those results back at the end of July. And as I look at you right now, there were no surprises, okay? Everything that we had talked about at the town halls and everything that we talked at during the focus groups, 
basically was validated through these army surveys. And what it came down to is communications, which General Jones has already uh, mentioned, right? Clear, consistent, transparent communications among the residents and Corvius and leadership, whether it be garrison or tenant organizations. Communication, number one, and, and the follow-up with that. Number two was the quality of work. Responding to it in a timely manner to address an issue, fixing it, and fixing it right the first time. So those were kind of like, yep, I got it, and that's not a surprise. What was surprising out of this survey, and one of our, the lowest scoring categories, was curb appeal. All right? Um, so with those three things, we transitioned focus groups into tiger teams. And they, these tiger teams and the garrison with Corvius, developed an action plan. Corvius, all privatized partners based on these annual surveys, were required to develop their strategy. How are they going to get after these deficiencies? That's what Corvius did. Theirs was due on the, uh, they were all due to Army senior leaders on the 1st of October. And this is kind of where we are today. The slides that are going to come behind me, I'm going to let um, Corvius discuss them because it is their action plan, but it was built with input from Garrison and input from you, the residents that served on the Tiger teams. All right, so for all of you Tiger team and focus group members out there, thank you, God bless you for helping us out here. All right, serious. So JC. All right, thank you, Colonel Sprague. Uh, good Please evening, as was Just mentioned nice. earlier. Um, uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Let me know if I need to speak up. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm JC Calder, the operations director here at Corvius. Um, as Major General Jones and Colonel Sprague uh, both have stated, um, you know, we've, we've made some progress. Um, but we've got a long way to go, and we, um, we understand that and, and, and want to work on that. Um, we've heard you loud and clear. Uh, we appreciate your feedback, and I want to personally thank um, all the people that have participated in the focus groups and the Tiger teams. Uh, due to your efforts, we've been able to map out a, a plan ahead. Um, when we went through the surveys, uh, you'll see these five areas that are up here. Um, these were really the five focus areas that came out that we really needed to put a lot of attention to. Uh, responsiveness and follow through, uh, property appearance and condition, quality of management services, quality of maintenance services, and renewal intention. So what we did is we took those five categories and we decided to come up with three focus groups and, or I'm sorry, three tiger teams. And there's a little bit of cross pollination there, um, but just really find some areas that we could work on and get some very candid feedback from, from our residents. Um, one of the things I wanna point out real quick before I go to the next slide, some of the efforts from the focus group and specifically from uh, those that participated, some of the things that we've, uh, we've done since we started the focus groups is we've uh, started having uh, badges to identify contractors, um, a more robust uh, preventative maintenance plan that does address the exterior of the home and gutters, um, self-help, um, an increased EFMP focus, um, we're looking at moving towards a, a resident advisory council that'll be later on down the road that will will kind of morph from the current focus group, but that's that's a ways down the road. A resident newsletter, um, a new app for you all to uh, put in work orders, uh, stamps and business cards for maintenance techs to be able to determine who was in your home uh, doing the work and then vehicle identification for maintenance personnel and contractors. Um, some of these items we've done a very good job on, others we're working on and we, and we need to get better on. Um, some of the other things that were introduced were uh, local call centers, um, increased warm calls and visits, and then also zone walks. Um, if I could go to the next slide, please. 
the Tiger Team focus areas that we broke down were curb appeal, communication and resident feedback, and maintenance. From those three areas, as I mentioned, there's a lot of areas that cross over there. Um, but we had a Corvius representative and a Garrison housing representative that head up, headed up each Tiger Team meeting. Um, so I'll start off with, uh, with curb appeal. Um, some of the things that were discussed there were actively doing zone walks, um, which is much needed and something that needs to be done. Um, so if you uh, start getting um, notices on certain things, we're trying to be very delicate with that. We don't want to be the kind of people that uh, show up and, and, you know, we agree to do this and the next day everybody has five or six notices. But please know that's something that's coming from the focus group and we're trying to be very mindful in how do we communicate that out to help clean up the community, but to do it for the greater good of the community. Um, We've established uh, an excavation process for noncompliance. So what's the, what are the best steps to go through? You know, reaching out to your community office. Then from your community office, if you feel like you're not getting what you need, reaching out to the Corvius leadership, but also knowing that you have the housing office to reach out to. And then different steps through there. Um, there's some tips that were brought up in terms of uh, some, some simple things like cleaning up trash cans, um, uh, things that we need to put in the newsletter, uh, better communication, better resident feedback. Um, but again, all three of these kind of tie in to, uh, to each other. Um, the next one we had was communication and resident feedback. Uh, that was headed up by Darla Humbles uh, from Corvius and Amy Stafford from the Installation Housing Office. Um, some of the initiatives that came out of that were uh, placing business cards in each community office, but on those business cards having Corvius leadership with, with immediate contact information. Hey, I'm not, I'm not happy with something that's going on. I want to reach out to uh, JC, the Operations Director. I want to reach out to David, the Facilities Director. I want to reach out to Christy, the resident manager, or I want to reach out to Darla, who's the ombudsman. Um, so that's, that's in place now. Uh, comment boxes were placed in all the community offices. Um, going back to something that was done previously, we opened call centers and hired local team members to take your calls during all business hours. That's something that's been very helpful because you have people that are actually familiar with the installation. Um, it's not going to a call center that's off the installation and it's people that are familiar with not only our team members but they're familiar with our home types um, and then for the contact information that I just mentioned we have magnets that have all of that information on there so we have some here if, if people want to pick them up afterwards as well um, then going on to maintenance uh, that was with uh, David Campbell who's our facilities director and Jay Lanning from the installation housing office uh, some of the things that we talked about through there were just items that you felt would help improve quality of life, but things that would help immediately and then things that were long term. Uh, some of the initiatives that came up were uh, things that seemed fairly simple, but it was like, hey, we have parking that is supposed to be designated and the numbers are wearing off. So we're having some situations with neighbors over assigned parking. And then that led to a different situation, which was DES getting involved to help us out to say, yeah, we really need to have those marked for us to be able to enforce that. So right away we went in and we repainted, restriped the lines, uh, and we, um, we have gone through uh, now and started uh, numbering the individual lots. Um, so that should be something that we continue to progress through. Um, We've started to implement uh, follow-up calls on work orders, not only on dissatisfied work orders, but just work orders in general. Um, sir, ma'am, we were at your house yesterday. We closed out this work order. Um, is there anything else that needs to be done? Um, and then uh, some other things that we've done is we've hired a quality control manager. Um, we've increased our presence with maintenance supervisors and senior service center coordinators. 
um, that will allow us to do a little more of that follow through. Um, and uh, that's that's really it for this slide. If I can go to the next slide, Girls Brag. <coughs> This particular slide right here, I'm not going to spend too much time on, but I, I actually asked the um, Tiger team for feedback on this because I said, I, I really don't know if I should show this slide because when I show it, it feels like it's a bit of an excuse. And the Tiger team provided some really good feedback and said, no, I actually think it tells a good story and it demonstrates where we're at. So real briefly, I'll walk you through this, this graph here. If you go over to the left hand side, you'll see where we were at about 350 open work orders. And that's what that first dot represents. And then it started escalating. Uh, we, uh, we started doing certain things. So we opened our, our work order call center. We hired RSSs. Uh, the remediation project started on post. Um, we hired an ombudsman. The reason we hired the ombudsman was for people that were having issues or challenges, they could have somebody to go to and specifically speak to that person. It's somebody that has a social work background. It's Darla Humples. Darla, are you? There's Darla. <laughs> so uh, many of you have spoken to Darla, but Darla is somebody that helps out significantly with the EM EFMP families and also um, just different issues that we may, may have that are going on. Um, we hired additional maintenance staff. We released the app. But as you see, all this stuff was being done. Our work order count was still going up. Um, and rightfully so. So there were command inspections that took place not only at Fort Meade, but across the entire DOD portfolio. Um, so that generated a lot of work orders. Um, and that was, that was a good thing. Um, it was difficult at the time because it put us in a position where we were trying to be as proactive as we could be. And quite honestly, it was very hard to get ahead. Um, we were being very reactive um, because we were focusing primarily on the emergency type scenarios that were out there. Um, so move over a little to the right. We actually hired some outside expertise with a company uh, uh, by the name of Johnson Controls. They came in and they were able to focus on some of the um, specialized work orders we had, HVAC, plumbing, things of that nature. And then as our staffing went up, our work order count started to go down. The reason I share that is go all the way over to the right. For open work orders now, we've been for the past three weeks in that range from anywhere from 300 to 400 open work orders. Um, that's not perfect, but it's far better than where we were with 1,600 open work orders um, when you go back to May. The reason I share that is the things that we've identified, or, or more specifically, the focus group and the Tiger teams have identified, we're going to be able to focus on that a little more and really um, put some things in place and follow through more, because that's what we want to do. That's what you all deserve. And I think we are in a better place now, but we still have, we still have a lot of work to do. Um, next slide, please. Um, so everybody's heard about the modernization uh, program and the things that, um, that Corvus is doing. I'll be pretty brief to go through this because I, I don't want to take up too much time. I want everybody to have plenty of time for Q&A. Um, but just some of the items that are, that are being done here at Fort Meade. Um, there's going to be 115 new townhomes that will begin construction in May of 2020 and it will conclude in December of 2021. As Colonel Sprague mentioned, uh, 110 of the historical homes uh, will receive new roofs. We're 80% through that work right now. Um, there are uh, 300 uh, current houses that we're going to upgrade to luxury vinyl plank. That's just in this specific project. We've actually done quite a bit more of that that we budgeted for, and we're going through and looking for opportunities to do that on turns as, we, as we're turning homes. Um, we're going to be weatherproofing more than 2,000 homes, and that will include several aspects to improve sa uh, safety and uh, healthy living for the communities. Next slide, please, sir. 
Um, some of the weatherproofing uh, uh, components will include uh, ceiling, uh, exterior penetrations, wall cracks, windows, door frames, vents, and things like that. Basically, what we're doing is we are partnered with Johnson Controls and we're coming in to try to improve the efficiency of the homes and, and, and how they operate. Uh, we're going to be updating nearly 43,000 light fixtures um, with energy efficient LED bulbs in approximately 2,600 homes on post and over 107 of the lamp posts that are out there. Um, we'll also be doing aerator devices on the uh, sinks, on the shower heads. Um, we're going to do uh, Energy Star thermostats in all the homes. And then here's a big one right here. Approximately 2,000 of our homes are going to receive Energy Star heating and cooling units. Um, so that's also going to be a, a, a big bonus for us. Um, there's going to be an additional 150 townhomes that are going to be built. Um, on top of the, the 115 that I mentioned earlier. So over the next two years, we're going to be delivering 265 uh, new homes here on the installation. Um, and I, I do want to share, uh, you know, before I, I wrap up my slides here, that um, we agree and sincerely appreciate the candid feedback that you all have shared with us. And we've still got a long way to go. Um, and we're going to we're going to keep working very hard uh, to get there. Um, but again, um, thank you all for for your feedback and, and uh, especially for attending tonight. Cool. OK, so I owe everybody an apology regarding the microphones, but we're going to do a little bit of an audible. I'm going to move back up here and I'm just going to go as we raise our hands. We'll go through, we'll go, we'll keep the same order. We'll go here for a question, then I'll look over here. We're going to have to project a little bit. And then if we get anything, as of right now, we haven't gotten anything, or we got our first Facebook question too, so we'll, we'll get to that in a second. So here we go. We'll start right here. All right, here it is. The first question we have, have the plans for the new construction in 2020 forward been reviewed by someone who actually lives with mobility issues? And that is from Miss Moon via Facebook. So I'll, I'll go ahead and take that one, Chad. Um, that's actually something that came up um, during our focus group meetings and um, something that, that we've uh, looked into. And, and I, the good news on that is we actually have somebody that works directly on our um, construction staff that, um, that has personal experience with that, um, meaning a family member in their household that has mobility challenges. Um, one thing that was shared during the um, focus group meetings that I think um, really put things into perspective for me, um, you know, if, if you don't have a family member or somebody that has mobility issues, you're looking at things and you're thinking, well, the doors are wider, the cabinets are lower, but people said that's no, but you really don't realize until you're in a wheelchair or whatever the scenario is that, um, you know, it's, there's, there's more to it than that. So that being said, um, we have talked to the person that we have on our staff and we are in the process of reaching out to try to see if we can find some people on post that would like to share uh, feedback with their homes um, on some of the challenges. One, one of the things that we heard um, was, uh, I'm trying to remember what it was, it was changing, uh, changing an air filter, I believe, but, but also not having accessibility to the garbage disposal switch. Um, things like that that we're looking at that we didn't really, I'm not going to say think about because we have a design team that tries to be very thoughtful in that, but until you have people that are actually, you know, have those, those limitations, it's, it's hard to see that. So my, my answer to that, Chad, is yes, absolutely. And if um, the person that sent that message in, um, we, will, we will reach out to them because we'd like to get some feedback directly from them. Okay. Yes, sir, just please stand up. Good 
Let me take first crack, then I'm going to turn it over to Colonel Sprague to talk about the installation access as well as uh, the, the, the cell phone issues and, and, and what we can do about that. First, thank you for your service. I, I won't tell you what I was doing in 1983 because it probably embarrassed both of us, So, uh, um, but, I, but I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, and thank you for being here tonight. Um, in, in terms of our commitment to our service members, regardless of service, um, but absolutely to our service members that live on our installations. I agree with everything you said. I mean, you, you think about what our service members do day in and day out for this country, and, and, they, and they deserve you know, quality housing where they don't have to worry about their family members, where they're able to focus on doing their job, that again, it is clean, it is healthy, it is safe, and I agree with you completely. Um, I, I do welcome the point that you said, it, it, it's kind of double-edged sword, that um, there are issues beyond mold um, because so much of our focus over the past, you know, really six, seven, eight, nine months has been on the mold remediation. We haven't fixed it yet. We still have a way to go. But now we're able to focus as well on those other issues, and, and you're right. Um, a lot of the things that we were talked about, that we talked about earlier are what I would describe as um, in the preventive maintenance realm, which we are able to focus a little bit more on now to make sure that we are getting ahead of some of these issues. They do not get to the point 
for the life, health, and safety. Because again, what our senior leaders are saying, what I am saying, what Colonel Sprague is saying, our Sergeant Major is saying, is that our service members and their family members deserve that housing, and we got to make sure they're, they're, that they have it and it's provided to them. Do so you want to talk to two specific issues? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Hey, Mr. Delgado, mm -hmm. thanks. All right. Um, the blame thing, okay? It, it doesn't really matter. I, I will tell you this did not happen overnight. It didn't happen on my predecessor's watch. This is literally since 2002 today, all right? Decisions at every level, military, all right, we're culpable, and, and the partner. It's just a series of events and basically neglect over 17 years that led us to the point that we are today, all right? It would be very easy to sit there and say, hey, you know, I'm not to blame. But the bottom line is, I'm the garrison commander. This is the problem I've been given, and this is the problem I'm gonna solve, right? It's the Army's priority, it is my priority, and you have my personal commitment, by the time I leave here, we're gonna be in a hell of a much better place than we are right now, okay? That's a personal promise. Um, so the profit piece, that, that, that comes up a lot in, in the conversation, all right? Uh, I'm not going to speak for Corbius, but there probably were some business decisions in the past. Um, and, and I'll take the call centers that uh, Mr. Calder just talked about, right? As a cost-saving measure, they moved a call center to like a centralized location. And this is one of the problems that the focus group jumped on immediately. Here's, here's the situation, or here was the situation. It's 10 o'clock at night. I got a pipe that burst in my wall. All right, there is an emergency contact number that you can call. So you call it up and another guy or a gal at the other end of the phone picks up and says, you know, Corbis hotline, how can I help you? Hey, I live at 1234 Roberts Avenue. My, uh, my pipe just broke. And they're like, okay, what state are you in? Uh, I'm in Maryland, Fort Meade. Uh, okay because the person you were talking to was actually out in Kansas, okay? Corvius recognized that. And part of them getting back to their, their gold service standard is bringing back that personal touch. That is why we're opening, or they are opening these community centers. So when you call now, you're talking to a person on Fort Meade, hopefully in the same neighborhood that you're in, all right? So making progress there. The cellular service, that is an issue, and I, I acknowledge that. All right, and uh, I yeah, really don't know how we're going to get over yeah. that one. But that's something we'll look into. Does that answer your question? Let's we talk about, about installation access as well. Installation yeah. access. Um, <coughs> yeah, I wish I could have service members sitting back on the gate. But you know what? That's not what they're trained to do, and that does not go anywhere towards readiness. Um, we are challenged, Fort Meade, we have about 45,000 people that commute on and off this installation every day from uh, surrounding areas. I've got Reese Gate, which is open 24-7. I've got Mapes on, in 32, which is open. I got Rockenbach, which is partly open. And I've got Llewellyn as a kind of a makeshift gate, right? We're, we're crammed, trying to get all these people on there. Um, we're getting after that. So once MAPES, uh, MAPES on 175, that will open up in the December time frame. So that expands the number of lanes we have coming on post. Race is going to stay open so that, you know, we got what we got. Then 32, right? So we're trying to open these things up where we can get more people on. Now comes the AIE part. And my provost marshal, um, okay, Jason's up there, and he can hit this a little bit more. That is the program of record. All right, to get people on and off the installation. But MCOM, AMC, and DOD are looking at other ways to kind of expedite this. And one of the recommendations that they've thrown out there is kind of like a fast pass type thing, where you have an RF tag affixed to your vehicle, um, so you're not stopping and waiting for the people and waiting five seconds for the gate to open and close. Um, the DES, they know better, and if you see something different, let me know. Um, but it, when cars are in a long queue, they do away with the AIE, they open them up, and then you have a, D, or a DA security guard that is doing a visual on your military identification to get you on, on 
on uh, the installation. All right, does that does that address your concern? Thank you for mentioning that, but uh, and that may be the policy, but that is not the practice all the time. I assure you that. Uh, the other thing too, and I understand force protection. I did that for thirty years in the Air Force. Uh, you got to have barricades, okay? But when they put the barricades up on Rock and Bob outbound, if any of your executives go and sit there at about 3.15, 3.30 to about 5 o'clock, you're going to see everyone breaks down to one single file line because, you know, we all learned in kindergarten, stay in line and don't, you know, don't go outside the lane. So literally, you'll have traffic from NSA on both sides of Cooper waiting. And then, of course, because people coming uh, towards yep. the housing area from on, uh, on Cooper, get on the rock and box and they're backed up because everyone, you know, is going out there. I've never seen it before. I did 30 years in the Air Force, but I just, <laughs> these gates have odd hours, uh, and during rush hour, it is just so backed up. But I don't think anyone who is making decisions is actually sitting out there at that time and looking to see how messed up it is. I've called the base police before. Uh, and said, hey, can you get somebody over here to drive traffic? Because it is just a parking lot. I moved from Chicago, so we're used to parking lots. So I understand that, but it's just like, it should not be happening here. And because they got those new portable barricades up, it funnels down to one lane, and it's like, when are you going to put in a barricade, pop a barricade or whatever, so that you can use both lanes to go out that construction from the Rock and Bach. I don't know if they're all been over there. But I have. over there during rush hour time. It's a mess. And I personally work in easy 26 miles each way. I sit on the parkway for almost an hour, and then I come and I stay in the line to get on this space. So <laughs> believe me, I'm more than ready to PCS just so I don't have to deal with uh, the traffic. Another thing, sir, and I didn't address this with you before when we sat down and talked. My neighbor, uh, single Army captain, female, uh, left one day and she left her garage door open. Her dog was running in the street when I got home. I immediately called the police trying to be a good neighbor. I explained the situation. The two MPs showed up, they go inside of the house, they check, everything's okay. Then they come out and ask me for my identification, my name, and my citizenship. My citizenship. I am Mexican American, but I am a veteran of 30 years. And I told them, look, if you have a call, call your supervisor, and I will talk to him. But I, this is out of line. So then a staff sergeant shows up at my door, knocks on the door. I said, Sergeant, I need to talk to your watchman because this is unsatisfactory. Well, I am the guy. I said, well, let's meet in the law enforcement desk because this is ridiculous. And I talked to a captain over there. But to ask for a US citizen, <laughs> US military member, what your citizenship is unacceptable. No, oh, I agree. So unfortunately, that's been a little bit of our experience that's working. Okay. Sir, if I could briefly just comment on, on a couple of things that you addressed. <coughs> uh, in addressing, uh, first, Colonel Taylor, I'm the Director of Marine Services here at Morgan. I've been on the job for about four months. Um, to address uh, first, Rock and Box. So we are tracking that the portal barrier do actually funnel down walk and walk. So currently at this time, we're currently working uh, in coordination with the NSA to try and get 20 foot barriers supplied to rock and walk, which will not only allow us to open up both lanes all the time because the barriers are wider, but also allow us to actually funnel traffic through rock and walk, uh, construction traffic, which will prevent all that moving through post as it goes onto the NSA. So that, that will attempt to help clear up some of, some of those issues. Uh, and in addition to that, what we've already highlighted is that we are currently working to hire more DASGs to address some of the main issues in relationship to each of the gates. That's going to allow us to put the more officers on the gates, keep the gates open longer, even looking at the ability to extend the hours to rock and walk once makes reopens after construction is all what we already did is that it is going to be uh, four lanes, so that will allow for additional traffic. 
We had site survey this week for AIE 4. AIE 4 is an upgrade to the current AIE system, which actually processes everything faster, so that will help expedite individuals through the gate once they scan their cards. That also includes new readers into the system, which will address some of the older readers that we have. Some of those readers uh, have quite a few years on them, so they don't read quite as well as they should. So that is also in the works as well. Those surveys are going for, and Fort Meade is one of the earlier installations that is going to be fielded that AIE 4 system. So that will be going into place in the next uh, eight to nine months. Uh, in addition, in addition to that, um, right now we are also um, addressing some of the uh, various concerns with the hours and the traffic as far as expanding. Um, looking at the IDs, currently right now we have set schedules for uh, checking the IDs versus running the scanners. I've directed all of my personnel to actually look at the traffic flow and adjust according to so that we avoid some of those backups, especially onto the major uh, highways uh, and through fares related to the installation. Uh, sir, as far as your specific issue, uh, if you would like to grab me after this, I'd be happy to take your information, sit down and, and talk with you related to what happened because I'm unaware of that incident occurring and uh, I'd like to get more information related to it. Uh, if anybody has any additional questions to me related to access control, I'll, I'll be happy to address them uh, as the night goes on. I'll also be available afterwards if you want to talk okay. to me specifically. Thank you. Okay. Next question. Christina. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, Christina Kosovich. Hi. How are you doing today? Can you hear me? That's we got you. You're good, Christina. Okay. It's okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm fortunate enough that I've gotten a bit of a front row seat to how hard the residents and the garrison and Corbius has worked to kind of fix our problem locally. Um, but um, we PCS. <laughs> and so no matter how hard we might work to fix our problem here locally, at some point in time, we're all going to go to different installations. Yep. So. Um, I guess while I appreciate the fact that um, you're committed to families, I'd like to know what the plan is mm -hmm. to ensure that it's not just us at our little installation doing everything that we possibly can to make it work and then it being a hodgepodge of solutions, but that we can actually have, is, is there a top-down plan and what is the top-down plan? Yeah. To one, make sure that this is fixed globally, and two, that we don't ever end up here again. How about yes and yes? <laughs> uh, no, there, there, there absolutely is, and I, I will tell you that it is not only the Department of the Army, but it's across the Department of Defense, and I think that was one of the big um, factors last uh, February, March, um, was the, the entire leadership of all of the services saying, okay, um, just as Colonel Sprague described, this was, this was years in the making, um, and, and there was lots of reasons, none of them good, but lots of reasons that we, we got to where we were across the department. Um, but deep, abiding commitment from all the service leaders um, to, to get this right and to keep it right going forward. And that's one of the reasons I mentioned up front this, the uh, continuity in focus of the Army leadership because although we've changed the leadership in, in, in all of the big five positions in the Army, the, the passion and the commitment to get this right has not changed at all. Um, the only reason I'm hesitating right now is because um, what I don't have a whole lot is the detailed plan of where we're going forward. Um, but what I will tell you is that everything from you know, the Army side of the partnership agreements how we work with our partners across the entire Department of the Army, the involvement of senior commanders like me, involvement of garrison commanders, the training of garrison commanders that come on board to reinforce their um, responsibilities as representing the Army in terms of the partnership with our privatized partners for housing. All of those things have been looked at and many of those things have already been addressed. And my understanding is that the other services are taking a very similar approach. 
what I would offer to you, so uh, I mentioned General McConville and his quality of life initiatives with housing being one of them. Um, and this is not a unpaid advertisement or even paid advertisement. But next Tuesday afternoon, the Army leaders are going to do a family forum um, that's going to be live down in D.C. Um, at, at our, our annual meeting, but it's also going to be on Facebook. And they're going to talk at length about all five of those quality of life initiatives. It, child care is one, PCS moves is one, housing is one, but all of these things that we need to do as an institution to take care of our families and through our families make sure we're taking care of our service members. Um, the approach the Army is taking is specific to the Army, but I know all the other services are taking very similar approaches to make sure that we don't ever get back to where we were in February. So what I would hope would be that when you PCS, and I think I can speak for the senior leaders on this, the experience that you're leaving at Mead, while Mead is an incredible post and a great place to live and all the rest of it, you should be moving into a very similar environment wherever else you, you go, and, and that's what the Army leaders are looking for. And so your experience there should not be 180 out from what you experience at Mead now. So please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so that's, that's frightfully vague. It was. <laughs> yeah, it was um, because oh, go ahead. Finish your question. Yeah. No, so, yeah. But so I guess since you were talking about the need for transparent communications, mm -hmm. um, then as as family members, what can we expect, and what would the timeline be for those transparent communications from the Army side mm -hmm. about what the next step will be? So okay, the next next step isn't there yet. Yeah. When might we know what that next step is going to be? And how, how are you going to ensure that that gets into our hands so that we are tracking, so that you are being transparent with us, not just yeah, the PPD side? Well, I'll give you an example, big picture, uh, is when the partnership agreements were originally signed um, at the installation level, because they're you're at the installation level with each garrison leadership and the, and the partners. Mm -hmm. There's an incentive structure in there that was not really a financial incentive structure. All those are being relooked so that at the Army institution level, there actually are incentives that are tied to finances that encourage business actions that take care of our families, transparent communication, and all the things I talked about up front. At the individual service member and family level, which you can expect and you should demand is the same thing I talked about here up front, that if you are not getting transparent communication, if your work is not being done quickly, and it's not being done right, then, then you need to jump up and down and you need to tell folks about it. And I mean that sincerely. Yeah. You need to tell everybody about that so we get it right. When you get to your next post, if you don't get that on day one, you need to tell everybody there. They will have a hotline. Every Army post, every Army installation has a hotline now. They will have a garrison commander who absolutely understands that they have a responsibility on the Army side of the partnership as they work with a privatized company. They will have a lawyer, they will have an IG, they will have a surgeon who all will listen to you when you say, I've got a problem and this isn't right in my house. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure that we could have said that on every installation six to nine, <coughs> 10 months ago, um, but wherever you're gonna go now, you should have what I just said, or if you don't, you jump up and down, and I guarantee the chain of command is gonna be involved and engaged to help you get that. So that's what off the individual level, where the Army's focus is how do we get the partnership and execution of the partnership agreements right so that we are all incentivized to make sure that we have the housing that our service members deserve. A little, little bit little less vague? A little, little bit? A little bit? Okay, yeah. you're getting there. Uh, Go I ahead. Would, I would just yeah. say, and I'm taking advantage of the fact that you're here so I can... It's I okay. That's why I'm here. Um, yeah. But I would just say that um, one of... Uh, I know that as a family member, mm -hmm. one of the big frustrations has been that every time uh, every time we've had an issue, there's always been another um, phone number to call. Yep. Um, that it seems to be that the quality control has fallen for the most part on us. Yep. So let us know if we're falling down on the job, not this is our plan to make sure we don't fall down on the yep. job. I and, agree with you. And while I am more yep. than happy to make noise, um, lots of people can attest to that. <laughs> um, I. I also know that there are lots of people who don't necessarily have the resources or the voice or the um, just the ability that I do to make that noise. And I would hate for us to be back in a position where we're saying, well, let us know if we're not doing our job. 
and for more of these families to continue to fall through the cracks because they simply don't have the same privileges that I do. Yeah, no, I understand. So I'd offer you a couple things on that. One, it is not your job to do quality control or quality assurance. Clearly, you're welcome to living in a house, and you know, I, I do in the house where I live in, and I understand that. But it is the job of both partners, both in this case, Corvius, but also the government. The, the army, they hit you in the face here. Um, but um, for the phone number piece, you're right. Um, and, I, and I think in sometimes we, in a desire to help, we have put out here are 50 phone numbers. And it, it helps if you have a very specific problem and you want to get the right point of contact. What I will tell you whether it is Fort Meade whether it is any other installation across the Army, they were ordered last spring to have a hotline. So if you don't want to call any other number, you don't want to call the housing office, you don't want to call the party, you don't want to call whoever, you call the hotline. And if for you, your friends, your neighbors don't want to call the hotline, Carl, stand up for a second back there, okay? Every command, um, the garrison commands as well as general officer commands have inspector generals. So Carl Henneman, Colonel Henneman back there is inspector general for MDW. Go to the IG. If you say, you know, I, I'm not comfortable you know, making the phone call, all you got to do is, you know, use a search engine on the internet and say, I want Inspector General for Fort Meade. The phone number will pop up, you call them or go see them. Um, if you say, I've got a housing issue, you're going to go to the front of the line and they're going to sit down and talk to you and they're either going to help you get the problem solved or say, this is exactly the person to call. So the hotline and or the IG. Okay? Yeah. Does that help? much better. Okay, so I worked my way down. More specificity that I went through. I appreciate the feedback. Thanks, Christina. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Jay. Hey, JC, we got a question from Morgan, Morgan Busby uh, from Facebook. Are the upgrades that you were talking about, are they going to be also happening in homes that are currently lived in, or is it, is it just going to occur in vacant homes, or when hmm. homes get vacated? No, so, um, I'll look straight ahead. Uh, the upgrades are uh, going to happen in all homes on the installation. And when I say upgrades, uh, specifically talking about the um, HVAC systems, uh, heating and cooling, uh, those will be in all homes. The uh, LED lights, those are in all homes. The um, aerators and, and those things uh, in all homes. Um, the, uh, um, I'm trying to think of examples of things that will probably not happen for the most part in occupied homes. Um, the uh, luxury vinyl plank. Um, there are instances where we'll do that in an occupied home. Um, typically that'll be if we have a situation where um, there may be a mobility issue or something like that. It, it clearly makes sense to come in and do that to help that family out. Um, those for the most part will be done on the turns. Um, let me see other examples that I can think of there because I want to make sure I'm covering everything. Um, the weatherproofing and all, all of that, um, that's something that will happen in, in all the homes. So we're actually going through a scheduling process right now um, where we'll be reaching out in, in going through and, and doing these these uh, items that I'm discussing in homes as people are, are in them. So uh, the answer to that, Chad, is is they will happen for people that are currently in homes. Cool. Any question from audience members? Mm -hmm. This man. Hello, my name's Sam Harris. I've been living here for four years. And for four years, I've had half-past shoddy maintenance work. Not even just that, I've also had my carbon dioxide cut, pipe cut, and have that capped. Even the fire department said that that's been capped illegally, and the job is not done properly. I've gone to Corvius about it, and Corvius maintenance crew, I, they sent maintenance people in, and maintenance men have been telling me for four years, this is not my job, and walk out. My issue is, we're getting ready to leave in six months. I want to make sure that I'm not going to get charged for the fact that my house has been a mess for four years because they haven't done their job right or they've come in and made messes of my house because they've cut up my vinyl flooring in my bathroom and my laundry room, trying to move my washing machine to put in CO2 pipes, tubes so that my stove would actually go out of my house instead of staying in my house. That was a fire hazard that I didn't know about when I signed the lease of my house. 
and I found that out three months after I moved in. So there's been a lot of issues. And as a spouse, a vet, and everything else, I also am EFMP. And to be told to my face that I can't have stuff that I needed to support my EFMP because they could not provide those issues for me when I gave them a doctor's note. They took my doctor's note and said, we cannot provide you all of these things, but we can only provide you half of the list. And you either take this house or we put you at the bottom of the list. And that's where we've been sitting. And as we've been living here for four years, the price of the house had been going up with the issues getting worse. The first year was the CO2 pipe. The next year it was, it was the plumbing. Last year we had mold and our flooding in our kitchen. They refixed our cabinets, but I can't use one of the doors because it hits the door frame. And I told them about it as soon as they put it in, said it's not my job to refix it. And they fixed the carpet, and I'm stepping on the nails because the carpet doesn't reach the board. But they said, that's not my job to refix that. So my question is, how do I go and get these jobs fixed? Cracks in my walls and stuff, how do I get this fixed? When I've got Corvius Maintenance men telling me, that's not my job. So yeah, hold on, JC. I, I'm going to turn it over to you in a second. Just Thank you, first of all, uh, for, for standing up and sharing that. Um, the fact that you've been dealing with that for four years, um, the fact that you know you, it is still that much of a concern for you, it, it's not okay. Uh, and, and that and that's you know sitting here representing you know our, our entire command and the army leadership. That that's what I want you. That is not okay. Um, so you know, JC will talk what Corvius is going to do going forward and having had the conversation with you. But from, from the government side, from the Army side, what you've been dealing with is not okay. Uh, so we're going to figure out what we have to do, okay? Yeah, JC? And I, I echo uh, General Jones' comments. Um, that's, that's not okay. Um, first and foremost, I'm very sorry about that. But the thing that I want to look at is uh, a couple of the things that you brought up. One, carbon uh, dioxide. So I've got somebody here. Um, that I'd, I'd like to send out as soon as possible. You're good. It's good. You're good. Okay. Good. Somebody I'd like to send out as soon as possible to check that out because that's something that I'd like to take care of immediately and, and verify that if there's anything that was capped, um, that it was done properly and, and we need to get the peace of mind it, on that. It's been capped. There's no more exposure to it. But when I had the fire department come and look at it, they said it has not been capped properly. Okay. So that that is still uh, very important. So um, if it's okay with you, um, after this meeting, I'd like to introduce you to somebody. Um, and I'll also come out. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send our, our QC manager. Um, Al Green, who's here, I'm going to send Al out, but I'm also going to come out with Al uh, because there's a couple things that I'd like to address. Um, one, to get down to the bottom of uh, not my job, um, I I want to say that is something that we have to get a lot better at. I, I feel like we are making some progress there, um, but I'm not naive enough to think that that still does not exist. Um, we have provided some pretty significant customer service training, um, but we've got a ways to go there. Um, so um, in terms of some of the other issues you brought up, I want to make sure that we get that taken care of in your house because we also want to give you the peace of mind that when you when you do, because I think you mentioned that you're um, moving or PCSing soon. Yeah, we want to make sure that those issues are addressed um, uh, in your home. So what we'll do is we'll get your information from you, um, set up a time, hopefully tomorrow if that works for you or, or whatever is convenient for you. But we want to get out there and we want to get out there right away. And um, I'm very sorry about that. We want to make this right for you. Okay. Next question. Hold on, hold on Chad, real quick. When our town hall's over, I'd like to get a few minutes with you, if that's okay, so I can get your name and address. We have two quality assurance staff members, and I'd like to send one of them out to your house. 
Okay. Audience question? If not, I got four more from Facebook that we can use. So, next question I have here for the group is, I live in a community where every front door has a large blue trash bin, a trash recycling canister. While these are great to have, to me, it, it is the worst offender of curb appeal. Dragging them around the backyard is not a good solution. And this for from Mindy Lynch. So what what are we doing in regards to trash bins, recycling bins, curb appealing So I'll I'll take the first um, crack at that. And in full transparency, um, we don't have a great answer at this point, but we are working very hard to come up with a good answer. Um, there's some uh, uh, ladies that I'm looking at right now that have been uh, very helpful <coughs> with our Tiger teams and focus groups that have brought that up. Um, and quite honestly, it's something that we've struggled with a little bit as well. Um, those, those homes, the way they're designed, the uh, trash receptacles are a little too large to fit both the trash container and the recyclable uh, uh, container. Um, in that section. So what ends up happening is residents um, leave their, uh, their cans, their receptacles down by the curb. Um, if you're not in that situation, it's easy to say, well, hold them accountable, make them bring the, the, um, the receptacles up, which uh, we've tried to do. And then we get feedback that, uh, hey, during the summer months, uh, they, they don't smell great. And they're right there by our front door and if I try to move them by my back door, well now one of two things happens. Either I have to drag it through the mud or through, you know, whatever it is, or I have to go the long way around the building because some of them are five plexes. So we are working really hard to come up with a solution on this. Um, we've knocked around the idea of possibly having smaller um, recyclable receptacles. Um, and then the second, third order effect comes in where people say, well, wait a second, we have as much uh, recyclables, as many recyclables as we do trash. So um, we are working very hard on that. That's something that we, we actually even discussed in the Tiger Team meetings to have a one-off specific group to try to tackle this. So there will definitely be more to follow on that. Um, and it's something that we, we need to address and we're in the process of doing that. Just don't really know what that direction is, is right now. Um, but hold us accountable um, and we will continue to discuss this because uh, I don't want to be at the next town hall meeting to say, oh yeah, that's right, I brought that, you guys brought that up at the last town hall meeting, I don't have any feedback for you. Cool. Do you have a question, sir? Blue shirt? No? Okay. All right, Christine. <laughs> Hi. Christina, um, go ahead, please. Yeah. Ms. Costello. Yeah. Um, so, uh, for the mold testing that we had, are we at the point where it's 100% completed, and where are we standing on the remediations? And um, then, yeah. that way I'm not jumping back up again. Um, and then, the call centers. We have great local call centers, but when we're calling for after hours and we're, we're still getting bounced somewhere else and the quality difference is big. Um, and so the result is that residents aren't always getting their uh, maintenance concerns addressed in a timely fashion because they don't necessarily know that on Monday through Friday, nine to five, they're getting somebody here locally, and after hours they're not. Um, so, is there can can we get? A, is there a way to like adjust the gap in that performance? So, if it's okay with you, Holly, I'll take the call center question first. Um, so, <coughs> that's that's actually really good feedback, Ms. Cassia Fudge, um, and something that we're aware of. Um, one thing that I will ask is if, if you have a specific instance where you've called in 
because this is what, what you're speaking of is primarily um, an emergency call, so it would be something that would happen after normal business hours or on the weekends. We have the capability where if somebody gives us a specific time that they call, or even a window that's a, that's a fairly small window, those calls are recorded. So we can go back and we can have those calls played back to us. Um, the reason I share that is because we're able to use that as uh, training purposes. Um, I, I'll give you an example, and, and we're probably, I'm probably telling on ourselves a little bit here, um, but one of the things that can be frustrating for people is I have a, a leak in my home. Um, you know, we've had things that are as bad as, thank you for calling in, uh, we'll take that down. Well, a leak in my home, okay, so is it, is it, or a leak in my house, is it inside, is it outside? Is it upstairs, is it downstairs? Is it in the bathroom? Um, where is it? So we try to work really hard with providing information to the folks at the call centers so they are able to hone in, get the right information, and then get that turned over to our on-call technicians. Um, there are a couple situations that I'm aware of where that hasn't happened, and we've been able to call back and find out when that happened, when that took place, and although it doesn't help the resident that went through that, it helps us moving forward. Um, you know, we, we do always have an on-call maintenance supervisor and an on-call technician, so we're, we're gonna have to brainstorm a little bit to think of, of potential alternatives there, but the one thing that I would like to share is if you do have an issue like that, if it, it really helps us out and it helps everybody else out if you can give us a specific example and, and a time where we can really dial into that. So does that help? It does, yeah. Um, I just, I do wonder what, for, I mean, and obviously this is the next echelon up, but what overall Big Corvus' plan is to make sure that, you know, when, when we are calling in with an emergency after hours, that we are getting the same high quality of service that we are getting when we call our local office. So it, it, it's, it's interesting. So I, I really appreciate the part that you, you're acknowledging that it, you see a noticed improvement during business hours. But I think what it's doing is it's exposing uh, some challenges that we need to look at after hours. Okay. Thank you. So, Christine, to answer your question, I appreciate you asking. I'm sure there's probably some other folks in the room that would like to ask the question as well. So, to answer your question regarding the inspections first, yes, the, the inspections are 100% complete. Uh, we have received the data for those inspections, and if you may have remembered from some of the focus groups we had, we actually started the remediation process prior to even the inspections being 100% completed. Um, Corvus is committed to take that data, immediately implement a um, remediation project plan, and implement, <coughs> implement those remediation plans immediately. So there has been uh, about 30, almost a third of the homes have been completed for remediation. We're still in the process of working through those plans. There has been somewhat of a slowing due to uh, going back to the Army to get additional approvals. However, we have uh, reached that point now and we actually have a implementation meeting to bring it back up to that original level that we were about two months ago. So we are in full force <coughs> of completing the remediations and we should have everybody taken care of very soon. We'll follow the same process that we've followed in the past with notification of the residents directly to do a walkthrough inspection of the home prior to the actual remediation beginning. We will um, work around your schedules because we, have, we want this to be as seamless and smooth of a process as possible, not to inconvenience any of our families. So we will uh, be happy to work around schedules as we go through and we start um, calling you to have that remediation. Some of you have already possibly had your home remediated. But for those that you have not, we will be uh, in touch. It's not something that's going to happen overnight, obviously. It's a lot of planning that goes into this and a lot of uh, coordination, but 
Uh, we certainly have a very uh, good system in place. We learned a lot of lessons. Lessons learned from our first phase, so we're looking forward to getting into the second phase and working through it as quickly as possible. Yes, sir. So our Sergeant Major, uh, Sergeant Major Salinas, uh, I spoke to some of the people here today, um, and basically this is for Corvius. Uh, been in the Army a long time, and I can tell you one of your major problems is it's follow through. Um, I appreciate, I do, I 100% appreciate the amount of effort that you're putting in hiring new people. But the problem with that is that you're hiring people to fix this, these people fix this, these people fix this, and these people fix this. And you're basically handed off. So I have an issue now that's being fixed. I appreciate an understanding who you go to when you have a problem. The ladies on the end are a good place to start. Um, and it's been about three months I had a flood. Um, three months to get the work done. And again, it's being worked now. Um, I came here with photos to show and I was upset about it until I spoke to the right people um, to get people out there. But the problem is, is that, you know, someone came out and fixed my flood. Within 20 minutes, I had someone at my door. Excellent. That person told me someone would be in touch with me in the next few days to fix the next problem. The next problem came out. Okay, and then the next person came out, the next person to fix this problem, and then it was lost. And it's never, never the tenant's responsibility to call the person you pay your rent to and say, hey, why haven't you fixed this yet? It's their job to say, hey, you called the work order three months ago. I just want to make sure that that was taken care of to your liking. That's what's not happening. So I think really that's the first thing that needs to happen. Hiring more people is great, but if those people aren't following through, getting in touch with the people calling, then you'll, you'll never know if the stuff is being done right. Um, so I, I think that's, that really is the start. Again, knowing who represents us is the next thing. Um, like I said, the ladies on the end is a great start uh, to, to say, hey, I got a problem. This isn't being done. Um, but I just want to add that my, my next question, basically, which leads me to my question. So I had damage to my property, and I'm not the only one. I'm sure there's a lot of people that had issues. I will tell you, and the example I gave, if I turned the water on in my bathroom and I left for the weekend and I caused damage, who is going to have to pay for that damage? Me or Corbius? It's going to be me because it's my neglect. So when I have damage from a flood, it shouldn't be my renter's insurance that fixes it. It should be Corbius's. So my question for, for Corbius to address then, if we're holding Corbius accountable, who is writing the check to me for my $6,000 worth of damage? Like, who is that person and how fast am I gonna get that check? Because if I was clearing housing tomorrow and I had damage to my floors, I can assure you I would not get my BAH for that following month once I checked out. So if you could please address that for the crowd the Facebook. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm gonna go to the damage of your property. I'm gonna answer your first question. The, I'm gonna start at the top and then go, go down to that. Um, so uh, first and foremost, Sergeant Major, thank you for your service. Um, appreciate what you do and you should not have to worry about your home while you're living here on the installation. So I'm sorry about that. Um, and I want to I wanna really see what we can do to improve here. Um, I don't disagree with anything that you said. Um, we are still seeing instances where uh, we need to get significantly better. And one of the things that we are looking at is too many people involved in the process. Um, some areas where we've noticed improvement has been when we've had our uh, uh, service center coordinators or people that work in our maintenance warehouse that are assigned um, to a specific um, situation or scenario and see that through from start to finish because that sir gives you a single point of contact and you're talking to the same person so there may be different contractors that are coming in and out but I agree wholeheartedly you don't need to be introduced to a new person every time somebody's coming to your house to address that so I agree with that 100% um, in terms of the damage to your property 
Um, I, I'd, I'd like to come out and, and take a look at that and work closely with, um, with our government partners just to determine what, what needs to be done there because I want to be fair. Um, when I say I want to be fair, I mean Corvius. We want to be fair. The partnership wants to be fair. And if there's damage that has occurred to your items um, from something that is, is not your fault, um, we certainly want to look at that and, and be fair to that. It's hard for me to comment specifically on um, this particular uh, situation right now, not just without having everything in front of me. But I, I definitely want to look at that and, um, and work with you on that, sir. If I can, um, so I talked a little bit about Tom Schiffer. There's a warning order, okay? Uh, at the beginning, I talked a little bit about resources available to you from the Department of Defense, from the Department of the Army. Um, the, the lawyers here, Legal Assistance Center that are here, are there, there to help as well. So, Tom, can you just talk briefly about what services are available through legal assistance to uh, family members and service members, please? Can I pile on real quick? Hey, sorry, Major, everything you said, I agree with you, 100%. But so the Army, we, we have a part of this as well, okay? So, um, you know, you had a flood in the house. They respond, they arrest the flood, okay? But what they didn't do is, well, wait a minute, what about the drywall? So then the drywall guy goes out there, right? And he replaces the drywall, but he's not the painter. So then the painter comes out. He, that is frustrating, and I know exactly. Trust me, I know exactly what you're talking about. But we have uh, we have play in that as well, All right? So anytime any work order, my charge to my housing team is a 10% sampling, where Debbie's folks, um, Jay and um, Lou, 10% sampling. They will go to the resident and they will check. You know, hey, did they? Did they do the work? Did they do it correctly? Okay, that's part of it. For life health safety issues, 100%. Any life health safety, my team is going to go out there. This is independent of Corpus. This is for us to make sure that A, they've taken care of the problem, they've taken care of the service member, and if they don't, that's when we engage Corvius and say, hey, get back out there. All right, I, just, I want to put that out because Corvius has a role, but so do I. And again, your team's been phenomenal. Debbie's been here for 45 years. Everybody's scared. When she talks, everybody listens. And, sir, we were at Sergeant Major's house today. Okay. Cool. We got, we got a few more Facebook questions. Uh, this one here is, is there a protocol in place for workers to walk around the back of the house? Uh, for potential maintenance issues. So if somebody, basically, if a maintenance person is walking to the back of their house, it, should they knock on the front door first? What What is the Corpus policy in regards to, to that? So anytime we're showing up at a house, um, we should be notifying the uh, resident. Um, it sounds like that, um, that may not be happening, um, so that's something that we can we can address with our team, and and, uh, and we can certainly look into. 
Um, if uh, it, it, it would be helpful to have uh, an example that's a little more specific, so we could we could look into that. But I will certainly um, address that, and I I understand that concern. Um, one of the things that we have done is move to making sure that all maintenance vehicles, um, whether it's uh, Corvius uh, employees that work directly for Corvius or contractors, all have marked vehicles um, for that reason when, when cars are parked. But I can certainly understand a concern if somebody's walking back behind your house and you're not aware of that. So we will, uh, we will certainly address that to see if we can, uh, we can get better there. Okay. Uh, so we've gotten to time flies and we're having fun. Uh, so we've gotten through the end to 2000. Our panel will stay up here for conversations afterward. I know we have some Facebook questions to answer. Thank you very much for your participation. As we posted, we will get that answer back to you within 24 hours. Uh, pending that, again, the panel will be here. And thank you very much for your participation. And sir, do you have anything that you'd like to close off with? Just, to, just a couple things. Thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, both the Facebook audience and everyone else that was here in the, in the audience. And I appreciate the questions for the folks that have had uh, challenges with housing. It's our major, Christina. Um, I'm sorry, what first name again? It's the same, same thing. Thank you. And, and, and I'm sorry you've had to deal with that. And, and, and we're, we're going to make it right, um, is the bottom line. Um, I mentioned the family forum next Tuesday. Uh, we'll make sure the chat has a link for that. It's Tuesday afternoon, I think at 3 p.m. or something close to that. We'll get to the details on it. But I, I would encourage you to listen to that because there'll be a lot of discussion about uh, quality of life initiatives from the Army leadership. One of them will be housing, but there are also a number of other things they're working to make sure that we're taking care of our people as we continue to make people the number one priority. But, but thank you for being here. The subject matter experts are going to stay down here until all your questions are answered. So if you didn't get a question answered, come on down and, and, um, and let us know. Um, but you should never feel like someone is not listening because the team here is committed to make sure we, we know what your concern is and we have the right people fixing it. So, so thank you very much.